Aaron Rose, welcome back to my podcast. And, you know, there's so many juicy things that often happen off the record. And I just felt such an importance of not leaving it out. And like you said, how we show up and how we lead behind the scenes is how we really make the difference when the cameras are on. That's the way I interpreted what you said. And so you asked me, do I have any intentions or prayers or something I would like to be supported by you in, in this conversation? And um, let's see, let's see what comes up. I just know that you have been such a beacon for me in leading in your sovereignty, leading from love and being uncancelable, having fun, doing your Kanye workouts in the morning, just like being such a full spectrum individual and such an incredible leader. You know, we worked in the capacity of you being my coach. I don't even know how long ago that was. Timelines are all shifting, but that was such a profound experience for me. So I've been lucky to experience so many facets of your aliveness, of you being the channel that you are. And I just felt a calling to reach out and say, hey, let's have this conversation. And it happened to be um, aligned. And here we are. And my only blessing is for the parts of me that still are very attached to this being a good podcast and people wanting to get so much from it and leaving me all these comments and saying how it changed their course or their life, because that's not up to me. I know that the alchemy, the only alchemy I'm responsible for is the one that happens when I get out of the way. And then it happens for me primarily, sometimes for other people and sometimes not. And that's none of my business. So my prayer for myself is to remember who I am. And my prayer for the listeners is to remember who they are, maybe have some fun. And my prayer for you is... To have some fun. <laughs> Amazing. And so it is. Um, I feel so grateful to be in conversation with you right now. You know, my perspective on the way that this came together is I was just feeling, I could feel you cooking up some things. I mean, you're always cooking up something. Like I can feel you always like there's, it's like you have a, you, my perception of you is that you have a very active laboratory going all the time and like because you're living life so intentionally and um, on a friend level I was curious and wanting just to drop in more fully and then um, when you presented the idea of us recording the conversation and actually just like showing up in our authenticity of um, what's present for us right now that felt it felt like very aligned with the growing edge that I'm continuously on because I feel like I've been through so many iterations of claiming my authenticity and embodying it. And I've hit these places where I feel a combination of like hard won, a hard won sense of mastery but hard one sense of mastery lasts for a little while until it begins to cycle back around to like youthful hubris in the way that we spiral through lessons again and again. And I feel like I'm back in that place in the spiral where I'm very humbly listening to what authenticity actually looks like for me in this next season of my life. So this unplanned but very intentional conversation feels like just a gift in that process yes thank you for reminding me that the seeds of this were planted of us just kind of picking up each other's frequencies in the field and being like hey i've been in a a cocoon hey i've been in a cocoon i'm just starting to emerge let's see where we're at and you know um i feel like last time we really deeply caught up i was honestly a different human being you know how they talk about ourselves constantly changing well I feel that my whole cell body system changed in the past week alone and for the first time ever I actually understand what the word sovereignty means not from 
how we can put it into words, how we can explain it to ourselves, to others on our Instagram, but truly like embodied clicked in. And it's like that with everything. We can't rush understanding any of these profound but simple rememberings. But when they click can, it's like, oof, okay, it's huge. And I remember when we um, worked together, you really guided me and pushed me very lovingly into being myself, just like waking up and being like, hey, God, I'm Ksenia, let's do this. You know, I'm surrendering my will to you. Let's just have fun, blast some music, mirror affirmations. And it was in the context of me feeling like I've outgrown breakfast criminals and I knew something was arising and didn't yet know what it was. And then slowly at home with Ksenia arose and I shifted my breakfast criminals Instagram, which has been a huge part of my identity for almost a decade into at home with Ksenia. And then I also shifted the name of my podcast to funded by source. And, you know, there's such beautiful boxes to check I've get, been getting so many compliments on Funded by Source. It's such a clean, source-inspired name that represents so much about this new perspective of how the new paradigm is going to be built. And I was a week ago, exactly, actually, at this time, right now, it was starting to kick in. I was in a ceremony and I was just taken, you know, when they say, I've been taken through a birth canal and I just saw everything and nothing. And I never really knew, you know, is this something that actually feels like they explain it, or maybe there's not enough words to actually describe what it is. And I actually experienced it. Like I went through the birth canal. I saw everything on the other side. I saw all of the webs of the matrix that I've been so busy living and distracting myself from who I am, my soul. And uh, a lot of my ceremony was really uncomfortable shit that I just wanted to run away from. And a lot of it was making so much fun of myself. You know, one of the invitations you gave me, um, one of our sessions was to compost like old thoughts, old beliefs, old ways of showing up and allow it to be transformed into something that is present right now. And I just saw how much of my desire to create these identities and build these brands and appear good in a certain way, how much of that, even like composting and at home with Xenia had a whole energetically had a whole context of it's this mindfulness woman who lives in nature and, and her sighting is, you know, um, it's sustainably sourced and it's zero waste and it's shipped mindfully. Even a nice person delivered it and brought me this dead butterfly. And it was so beautiful and spiritual. And I just saw how much, even of the good things that we think are good for the planet and good for us, for these human bodies, how much of it has become in my life, a distraction and how much energy was going towards just appearing, you know, Oh, I'm sustainable. I'm inclusive. I am pro this, I am anti that. And all of these labels were just like totally burned. And so now I'm re-emerging and you're going to be one of the first guests on the Ksenia Brief podcast. Amazing. Goodbye labels. I feel, I have full body chills right now. If people are only listening to the audio, I've just had this like ear to ear grin, just witnessing this and, and feeling the truth, like the truth your truth and also the place where I resonate so deeply with those moments where you wake up and you're just like, here I am once again in a box that I consciously built brick by brick for myself, thinking that it was authenticity and it was, but actually there was a deeper drive for safety and appearing good that is like my Achilles heel that is my that has been my growth edge as well um and when all of a sudden you wake up and you're just you realize that you have the key to the door and you walk out of oh the life that you've built into something more authentic yet again so I would love to hear anything else that you want to share about yeah what was feeling inauthentic and and what what is this realer, truer 
you or you that you are stewarding now? Mm. So much. Um, so much of it has been, you know, having the invitation to just be myself. It's so simple, right? Just be yourself, be authentic. And I didn't really understand what it is. And now there's this deep understanding of my only job is to vibrate at the frequency of my own nature and everything else is not up to me. And my biggest contribution to the field is when I'm truly myself. And, um, you know, I realized that being human is only really tough when we try to be more than human. So part of that, <laughs> yo, let's just take a moment for that. <laughs> that right there is who that has been hitting me so deeply lately. Being human is only really tough when we try to be something more than human. Which we are. And we also chose to come into this lifetime and like a crystal gather all, all the energy up and put in a human body. So towards the edge of the ceremony and edge, oh, interesting edge. I don't know where that word's coming in. We'll see. Towards the end of the ceremony, when I was landing back in my body. I just thought, okay, what the hell do I do with this now? How in the world do I live when you've seen all of the energies, how they work together, how we create everything, how the whole matrix of our lives is just us creating roles that we end up playing full time. <laughs> you know, what do I do now? Like, cool. All right. Um, and then I just waxed my body, put a nice cream on after a really nice shower under the stars. And I just felt this clicking in into the body of just like waves of, okay, this is a female body. I feel very aligned with it. How can I honor it? And how can I love, allow and love the sexual energy to move through it as the life force that has landed in this human body and that has chosen to stay on this earth? Because in the beginning, there was a choice. There was all these human reasons, pretty valid reasons why I could choose not to stay. I mean, anything is valid, anything that we allow our fear to feed becomes validated by other humans or by just energy outside of us. That's what I've seen. And I initially actually chose to stay and not to leave this body and cross over to the other realm for good out of fear. I really didn't want others to be in pain. I didn't want my loved ones, my friends to be in pain and, and suffer and be in grief and you know, it was this arc towards the end of it, I realized that um, living out of avoiding pain, whether that's mine or someone else's, is not what we're, we came here to be. It's not what I came here to be. And I really, I believe none of us came here to live in avoidance because that kind of energy just takes up so much of our life force and ends up clogging all of the channels of creation. And so I was just invited to recreate what am I here to do what am I here to be and it became very clear you know after all of the laughter at myself having all of these reusable totes that I shop with and doing the compost and um, I was shown so clearly that that's not about it it's about me just choosing to show up as myself and you know a huge piece that clicked in there was often I look at other people who appear to me as these confident beings who just so easily show up. Um, and I wonder, you know, like, where did they gather up this confidence to just like do these vlogs and do these Instagrams and podcasts and just like trust that people will care. And even though with my work with my mentor, Michelle and everything else I'm doing, I've realized that, okay, validation is not it. So then it's self-sourced and what I saw is that it's a self choosing process. It's not that someone is going to come to me, which is what I relied on up until now, up until a week ago. 
I've relied on people to come to me and say, hey, Breakfast Criminals is such a cool name. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, let's go create content. Or someone will be like, oh, funded by source. Oh, my gosh. It's so spiritual and expansive. Oh, my gosh. And I would just like jive on that energy and like hop on that surfboard and create content on that surfboard. But I didn't realize that the surfboard was actually B-Y-O. Like it's mine. I get to create it. I get to bring it. And I'm the one who gets to choose. And it's only between me and my soul, me and source. And it's like a whole new understanding of how I can show up from the place of being me and nothing else matters. No outside validation is nearly as important as me knowing that I've done what I've been meant to put to do in this moment. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of this and walking through this and speaking about, you know, that choice point, because anytime, you know, we're really being reborn into a more authentic embodiment, at least in my experience, like we come to the authentic face off with death. However, that looks, whether it's like truly about a choice to stay in the human body or it's hitting the human body and the nervous system and the consciousness in the same way of, oh my gosh, like I, I am passing through like a a place of no return on a certain level. And there's so much that um, I'm having to let go of in order to step into what this next thing is. And there is that, I wrote down fertile void earlier like there's that moment of it's like a pregnant pause where it's like you're aloft between both realities and you're not sure if you're going to fall into the chasm in between them and you can't actually reverse the momentum to stay where you were but you're still not quite sure experientially on a human level like how it's going to feel to be in the other place Um, so I'm just honoring like the bravery that I hear in your process. And I would love to hear more about the shift in the name of the podcast and like what, if there's more you want to share about like what it is that you're meant to bring through this like mm-hmm. beautiful human crystal that you are. <laughs> and the crystal thing is actually so resonant because it's like this choice to embody a frequency in a deeply deeply tangible way Mm. yeah you know in the past couple weeks um one thing i've realized because i've done different things i've done blog instagram tiktok very various expressions of different messages that i'm bringing And podcast has remained a constant that feels so aligned and it truly feels like a home. And I get to connect so deeply with myself, with my guests, with my listeners. It's my favorite platform. And what I realized is in the past two weeks, I have been getting very frustrated with the fact that, okay, I've rebranded. Now it's a very aligned name funded by source. It's a beautiful cover. People are loving it. And yet the downloads are kind of still the same. The reviews, you know, are kind of still not popping off. And my ego was just getting so frustrated that, okay, I did everything that looks so cute. All the marketing things are right. The branding things are right. And yet there isn't like thousands and millions, whatever those numbers are for each category, you know, millions of downloads. And my mentor, Michelle, actually asked me, she said, why is it important for you to have thousands of reviews and millions of downloads? And I realized that there's part of me that somewhere hidden deep inside knows that for sure, if there are way more downloads and reviews, then it will reach more people and remind them the truth of who they are, because that's what ultimately the conversations that I hold are about. It's exploring these different roadmaps of truths that like little sparks drop into people's hearts and remind them who they are in their own way. That's my intention. And yes, that part exists, but then I discovered there's like a shadow part of it that was still very present too. And it's this validation of 
oh, and then, you know, it will be featured on Apple and I'll be able to get certain amount of money for certain amount of brand sponsorships. And it was very much this external validation of, oh, look, like she has a top podcast, top hundred podcasts in the US, whatever, like all of, there's so many labels that I've collected over the years that mean nothing. And Eric beautifully reminded me, you know, when I was complaining to him, I only get 10,000 downloads a month. What am I going to do? You know, I've been putting so much energy and so much love into this. Like, what the hell? And he just said, I don't know who's talking right now because this is not how I see you. And 10,000 downloads is 10,000 opportunities to inspire someone. And I really heard it, but I didn't have the space to truly receive it in my heart. But once I saw how even beyond the validation piece, even the name funded by source became very limiting. In the beginning, it was this beautiful invitation to co-create with the energy of co-creating with God, you know, how your insanely amazing course, God is my boss. It's to me, that's like very similar energy of like, when I allow myself to take it step by step and be the channel that I'm meant to be, I am provided for taking this leap into co-creating with your soul, co-creating with God, with the divine, with the universe. And I realized that within me, even naming the podcast funded by source and posing that question to my guests of, so how are you funded by source? Okay. You do all these cool things. That's awesome. I'm very drawn to your work, but how do you get the money in the bank? And it was the part of me that still didn't believe, even though I've lived it, there's part of me that believed that I need, need needed proof. I needed to go around the world and collect it so that I can believe that I can be funded by source and I can take that leap. And I just realized that I'm done asking because I know that I am funded by source. So let, when we go beyond that, what's possible? It's just creation. And I started writing down the names of all the different uh, directors. You know, I want to have the creator of Mr. Robot on my show. I want to creator have the creator of C on my podcast. And within the context of previous podcast names, it would have been just so small. And with just my name being the name of the podcast, it's just, I'm going to hold the space and I'm going to get out of the way when I'm meant to get out of the way. And I'm going to sprinkle some medicine if I'm meant to. Um, and if I'm the only person who's meant to listen to it, that's cool too, because the alchemy is just in me being present to it. And, you know, I reserve the right to change the name of the podcast next week again. <laughs> but all I know is my truth in this moment. And in this moment, I'm learning how to be Ksenia Brief, learning to be this chick in this body. And that's all I can do. And that's all I know in this moment. Amen. It's beautiful. I'm just, I'm just taking it all in, just witnessing and feeling like the deeply, expansively grounded truth that I see you living into. And I love the way that you've like allowed yourself to make and remake the podcast and yourself, right? Because it's this constant, you know, even now with the levels of embodiment and authenticity that we're both stepping into, it's like, there's going to be another level, right? And so it's also this like practice of not clinging to what was working, even if it was working a week ago. Um, and I just feel it's interesting to see how I just feel this really deep movement for a lot of us who've had that deep soul awakening, especially in the last few years, like that deep integration where it was like, whoa, okay. Like I understood that I was a soul having a temporary human experience, but like now I'm seeing it and getting it on this way deeper level. And, you know, for me to kind of track back and see this like depth of connection that I cultivated with God and what that did for my life. And, you know, really even just understanding metaphysics and understanding like the unseen or the less seen laws behind how this reality works. Um, and I've been personally saying that I feel like I'm in a season of coming down off the mountain with all of the spiritual truth integrated as still just one aspect of my 
deeply physical, multidimensional human self. And I hear that in what you're saying as well. It's like you had to go to that pinnacle of the soul connection and the spiritual conversation. And now there's this like reopening. Is that how it's feeling for you or would you describe it differently? Yeah, it's also this humor, (laughs) sense of humor. I'm just, you know, I sit down at my desk since last week and I look at all the crystals and all the cacao beans and all the flower essences and I just tune into what I need and I'm like, I need nothing. I am the crystal. I am the flower essence. I am everything I need. And, um, you know, not to disregard, like I still use all these things and love them and admire them. Um, but there's a lot more, even coming out of the ceremony, there wasn't like a desire to, um, do anything special. We watched Seinfeld. I never watched Seinfeld before. And the night when the ceremony ended, Eric was like, do you want to watch Seinfeld? And I said, yeah, sounds human enough. And, you know, even like designing my new podcast cover there, I was like, I just don't want it to look spiritual. I want it to look human. And I think so much of me was so um, attached to the methods of getting somewhere and appearing spiritual enough to myself. And now that that's out of the way, you know, when I knocked on the door, I heard the question, you know, you keep knocking, like, what do you want to see? Are you ready for this? Like, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'm sure. And I just went on a roller coaster ride and I, I saw it after knocking for so many years. And, you know, previously in a, a lot of the probably, well, I guess all of the ceremonies, I haven't really gone that far. It ended up being healing for a lot of my human aspects, either this lifetime or past lifetimes. A lot of it would end up in me kind of just crying to Snatam Kaur and being like, okay, I know how to love myself. You know, just like unlocking piece by piece, these little things and integrating different lives that my soul has lived. And this time I really wanted to do that. I had all the playlists set up. I had my sheep stands and my amazing lights and everything was set up. And I was sitting there on my heated mat with all of these amazing things. And I couldn't because the being was just so loud And I really just needed to be present with it. And yet my brain was so busy trying to get me to do something else. When, when the being is so loud, which um, I also equate to sovereignty, like when we allow ourselves to be channels for that being sovereign beings and just be what we're meant to be in this moment, there's not really time to like look around or compare or go out of our lane it's just, I guess that's why they call human human being. It brings me to the energy of nature. Like I have a, a joke with one of my friends where we talk about having big whale energy. <laughs> and I think <laughs> about how whales and trees, like they, like if you feel kind of the, the weight of their energy and how much it impacts the world, but how rooted they are. And, you know, there are certain whales that swim very fast and move rapidly, but there is a huge amount of, when I think about like big blue whales and, um, you know, the, the biggest whales that exist, there is this, this sense of like, I am what I am and I'm holding my frequency and like, you're welcome. And also I don't need you to thank me because I'm just being myself Mm. and I'm not bothered by the the other tides and the big whales you know it's interesting that the biggest animals are often herbivores too you know like they're those big whales are eating i guess not an herbivore but they're eating like the little um plankton and things like that and so there is almost that like humility as well of um how they're flowing and there's also this energy of being unmessable with and i've been really into that vibe And at the same time, as I'm learning from A Course in Miracles, even the idea of there's like an energy of defense and being unmessable with that's inviting attack. And that in itself is taking us from creating love or being love 
into being in the energy of fight and attack and defense and destruction. And for sure, that quote in A Course in Miracles, in my defenselessness, my safety lies, that was like a multi-month ego death and spiritual awakening for me <laughs> a couple of years ago. It hit me, it called me all the way out in the ways that I was constantly trying to figure out better ways to armor myself against those who had presented themselves as bad guys rather than understanding like my part in perpetuating the conflict. Mm. So Aaron Rose, tell me about the mountain. Sunny brief. <laughs> tell me about the mountain you've been climbing, what you brought oh. on your journey with you, kind of, you know, these photos where they do a beautiful layout of what's coming on their backpack on their journey. Mm. And what did you decide to get rid of on the way? And what are you experiencing walking down? How does that feel? Mm. So it's interesting. It's like the last few years for me have been this increasingly spiritual awakening into my power and really understanding what it means to be in the world, but not of it. Like really coming out of a completely third dimensional consciousness where I was simply seeing things as like third dimensional chess pieces moving around on the chessboard. Like if there's traffic, the only way for the traffic to move is if like the people in the front start to move, not if there's traffic, like where am I energetically available to having a deeply frustrating experience of life by like being in this traffic? Like what is my part in creating a world where traffic jams occur? Like what about the power of God to like come in and create opening and shift for people and like understanding things on a more energetic and met metaphysical level um, and having that awakening on a deeply soul level basis of being an ambassador of love. And this is stuff, you know, from an early age, I had that sense of I'm here to make a difference in the world, or at least I hope I am. Like I want to be, I want to, I want to contribute to making the world a better place. Um, and the last few years have been reintegrating that soul level spiritual understanding. And now I feel, and there was a, there was a necessity of almost like monk, like isolation in a certain way. I've, I have amazing friends and I'm very connected and I'm always prioritizing spending time with people in a certain way, but in terms of like my daily domestic life, it went from being very interdependent, but kind of in an old relational paradigm that was very codependent and um, not actually nourishing the people involved. And I took that space to really like detoxify within myself and look at my part in being in um, distorted dynamics where there was a lot of fear and control. And I feel like I'm in this season now of, okay, so I understand God is my boss. I understand that I'm this eternal soul here having a temporary human experience. And I understand that like our theories of change in our lives and in the world need to include something beyond sort of a Newtonian phys like physics if this, then that relationship with just the physical world. And then, and then what? <laughs> that is what I'm, I'm living into now is how do I now take that? And it feels like I'm physicalizing my work in a deeper way. Like I have a long history of being an activist and working with community groups. And I'm feeling a lot more called just to, to step I feel like I'm in a fertile void right now where I'm really listening. And that's been the message is there's this deeper gestation occurring. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at with new eyes again at the question of what does it look like to really build a world where we all thrive um, and allowing my humanity in this new way. And that includes also just like aspects of my gender and my sexuality and having, I've had like a very multidimensional and fluid experience of identity that for a while I felt very integrated in. And I felt like maybe I'm not really going to talk about 
being queer that much more anymore? Like, does that label even resonate if I'm just like connected to all that is and now there's this landing back into it and it feels like I'm tending, just feels like I'm tending to the physicality of my life um, in a new way. So I don't know how much that makes sense, but I trust that you can feel the vibe and I'm happy to, um, yeah, happy to share more. I would love if it feels aligned for you to go more in the queer aspect of your identity and why or why do you think it's coming back wanting to be expressed through the human aspect of yourself and with that you know how do we or why do some aspects come to just stay and be integrated in the spiritual realm but for some of them it's important to become a piece of our human identity because you know some some of us choose to go and say okay i'm just gonna be a non-dual being now and i'm gonna be an expression of oneness and array of light um for me i think it really depends on what stages of our it's such a funny word awakening but what else is it remembering i think it depends on the stages of remembering i know that for me right now it is being this human then maybe one day it will go beyond and I'll be able to be of service to um, more directly. Um, but for now, I'm in service by being me. Have you been following me with me? Because I've barely been following I what I'm so. saying. I feel I know like I we're, we're, we're swimming through the, the, the seas of space and time together. Um, yeah, I think I, I really resonate with what you said about being non-dual because a huge part of my quote unquote awakening, my remembering was connecting with the fact that over identification causes suffering, right? So I was in a relationship with my earthly identities in the past where it was my life. Like I grew up as um, a kid in a very religious context with a lot of religious trauma happening, very conservative energy and um, being really multidimensional in my gender and my sexuality, um, in working my way through, I, I like to joke, or at least I used to joke, but I'm bringing it back that I've literally been every letter in the LGBTQ acronym. Um, I have tried all those labels on for size and I've like shifted and molded my being into who I really am now. But because of how traumatic that was, because there was this oppositional force of you're bad, you're demonic, you're ruining the fabric of society by being yourself, you're all of that sort of homophobia and transphobia, it, and, and very real discrimination, you know, being attacked on the streets of New York City for like, now I have a much like a, I think the average person on the streets of New York City, especially if I'm like wearing my backwards baseball cap, Yankees hat, um, just sees me as like a normal, quote unquote, normal, like white dude, straight bro. But um, I have appeared much more gender fluid and sort of gender non-conforming and unclassifiable in different seasons of my life and experienced a lot of discrimination based on that. Um, and it put me in a very oppositional place where my, I, for years, my internal sense of happiness was very connected to how other people were seeing me. It was like, okay, you know, I made it through not being bashed on the subway today. Like today was a good day. And that is a very real human experience, a very real trauma that I had to work through and I'm still working through. Um, but I started, as I had that deeper level of remembering, there was a piece there where I started to realize um, the way that my world had been constructed reactively to other people's reaction to my identity. I was like, I can't be friends with straight people. I can't be, you know, I need to make sure everybody in my life like completely understands, you know, this aspect of me because otherwise I'm not going to be safe. And, and I really limited who I was able to connect with in that way because I was in that kind of traumatic stance. And so there was this like release of feeling like I can love and accept myself enough and be legible enough to myself that I don't have to lead 
with my identity. And the last piece of that was that because I was doing a lot of diversity and inclusion work and I was doing a lot of like corporate culture work, helping people navigate identity-based conflict and repair those wounds. I was also like, my livelihood was connected to me going into spaces and almost like legitimizing my humanity and helping people understand how to see my humanity and see the humanity of people who weren't like them. And that was such beautiful work. And in some ways, I know I'm gonna keep doing work like that, but there was a part of me that just needed a break, that needed a break from leading with this highly polarizing aspect of my personal experience. And it's been interesting because I feel like the stakes have only gotten higher and it's, it's something I'm still navigating and I can feel myself stepping into a new level of leadership on is what does it mean to just to fully own my experience, knowing that some of the words I might use to describe myself are more triggering to the average person than they were even a couple of years ago because we're in such a heightened cultural discourse around you know who the good guys and the bad guys are and um, whether or not we actually have a right to authentically express ourselves so that's mm. yeah that's the journey that i'm in right now mm. And in between there was Hawaii, there was lots of river interactions in upstate New York, some alpaca hugging. What are some of the things that you've been doing on a human level to support yourself as you move on this journey? Mm, beautiful question. I'm so glad we got to have those alpaca moments when I was living in upstate New York. Um, that was you, a- you legit whispered to those alpacas <laughs> energy that calmed them down because Eric's lover Purple Rain who we're not friends with right now because she's pregnant and she just spits at everyone who tries to come close to her but probably not you Aaron but she was having a moment and she wouldn't let us come close to her even though we're hugging her and kissing her all the time and you just did I mean I'll let you speak more to what you did but I believe it was a form of a loving kindness meditation that got her tamed right there and then she let Eric come to her, hug her, kiss her for hours after that. That was such a beautiful moment. I felt, it felt like such a gift to be able to, to like, to see that farm and to experience that aspect of, of your guys's life. Um, and I did like I, and that is, I think it's a beautiful example of that kind of integration of the spiritual into the physical human experience Um, because I just saw that golden light that's at the core of everybody's heart. And I saw it connecting to the light in the, in the alpaca's hearts. And I just said to them telepathically, like, we love you. We're safe. Like, it's okay. Like, I totally respect what you need to do, but we would love to interact with you. And just like felt the energy of opposition dissolving within my being and Um, it's funny because I've used that in like extremely high stakes conflict resolution situations with humans in the work that I do. Um, but I got to use it on the alpacas that day. I love it. I've tried to do it since it didn't work out. Well, I feel like it's, yeah, it's one of those things too, where it's like maybe in their sovereignty, they, um, you know, they're, they're going through whatever they're going through in terms of their desire to, to be connected with. Um, But you asked about things that I am doing physically in my human life. Um, Well, one thing is, so I I moved to Austin, Texas, which feels like a chapter that I'm in right now. And I'm still staying tuned to where, where the, like my long-term home base is going to be because I really want to buy land and like do the homesteading thing and all of that. But I feel like this season is here for a reason. And so even just like filling my home with plants and like taking care of the physical home um, and like building a really beautiful daily routine here that's about not just like keeping my frequency aligned on that multidimensional level, but it's about like soothing my human nervous system. Um, That's been really beautiful. I've been swimming 
uh, right now I haven't been swimming in two weeks because I'm healing a tattoo, but generally swimming every morning in um, Barton Springs pool, which is just this like incredibly clear, beautiful water. And for me, um, swimming is just like, it's the best. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I've been going deeper into Qigong, um, which is a form of intentional movement and energy cultivation um, that's really helping me like get into my body on a deeper level. Um, I've been, I'm looking at my piano or my keyboard across the way in my office right now, just like getting into playing music again. I have a guitar and um, really just, it feels like I'm carving out more space than I have in a while for all the little human things that I love to do. The last thing that I'll say is I'm looking at this very old book from the 1600s that I've been reading and um, for my human self, which is really just myself, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love to read, I love books and there's a used bookstore that's like honestly a freaking portal of magic it feels like the wall might open up and like take me to mm -hmm. like a different dimension where I could just have tea with all of my favorite authors and it's like five minutes from my house walking and I go there all the time now and um, I love to like collect books and read books so I've been doing that too mm. you know as we um, as we navigate the integration of the human self of the awakenings the lessons how we express it um one of the things that has really resonated with me about what you shared some time ago is this idea of being uncancelable and i think it's tying back into what we're saying about being unmessable with and it's also tying with sovereignty um, I had a little experience a few months ago where for a hot second, a few people tried to cancel me. Um, and I would just really am so grateful to have been supported by my friends, by my mentor to drop back into my center and connect with creation and connect with the fact that I alone know my soul. I know my intentions. And when I know there's shadowy shit in it, it's my job to clean it and no one else's. And I was able to just recalibrate my energy to go back into creations instead of being stuck of, oh my gosh, this is so scary. Um, and you speak about this so beautifully. I would love you to bring in whatever feels aligned on that topic in the conversation. For sure. Yeah. Oh, canceling is, it's one of those things that is so horrifying that we're navigating but it's such a gift and my like context with cancel culture started from my roots in social justice activism diversity and inclusion work and um, right around the 2016 election which was a big moment for everybody no matter where you where you fell I think it was for me at least it really it started to ramp up that energy of like, wow, we've really got a problem here. Like we've got a feeling of like irreparable vitriolic separation occurring within our, our culture in America. Um, and so the calls that I was getting in my work started to shift where, you know, people would generally be inviting me to come in to talk about inclusivity. And for me, inclusivity was never about, you know, like, meeting quotas or having behavioral norms for people it was much more i would call it conscious cultural design like what is our what are our values and how do we actually embody them and co-create them as a community as a company um, and i started to get more and more calls from people not just asking for proactive work but people saying oh my god this thing's happening online and someone told me that i should call you and so i ended up really ministering to the front lines of this Cultural, mom cultural moment over many years. And what I found was that, you know, when the cancel thing comes up, it's always a reflection of something within ourselves that needs to be more integrated. Sometimes on identity-based things, it's literally like, whoa, actually, like I still am carrying subconscious separation and bias against the group of people 
that's calling me out. And maybe I didn't do anything wrong, but the vibe is there and the ancestral trauma is there and there's stuff for us to tend to. Um, and then, you know, there's that aspect, but there's also just the way that it, it reveals where we're still canceling ourselves. Like ultimately it's, it's a mirror to our own internal separation. Um, and I've gone through in the last year alone, a couple of different attempted cancellation moments. And, you know, it hits for me at all, as prepared as I am, when it really hits, it hits at that like survival mechanism level of, okay, I'm about to cease to exist. I am being kicked out of the group and I will die in the elements or like they will murder me and it's over. Like, you know, like time to pack it in, beam me up, Scotty. Like there's that feeling of, of extermination. But then on the other side, like you said, only you can really know who you are. And so for me, every time the cancellation conversation has come up, it's this initiation out of external validation and into internal authorization. Because when that happens, I see it with my clients, I see it with myself. It's like we scramble. There can be an instinct to scramble for the external validation of like, I'm not bad, right? Show me, you know, tell me that what I'm doing is okay, yes. right? And like, even if that is true, it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy fully. And I, and I see these moments of referendum like bringing us even more fully to ourselves and anyone that has been that I've watched go through a cancellation moment um it has there's usually an integrity piece there for them there's usually something that's asking for deeper alignment or it's like expressing that there's a way that they're showing up that is expired and then ultimately like if you meet the moment you emerge just even more authentically shakable, not defensive, like, you know, I know that I'm right. Stop yelling at me. It's like, honestly, feel whatever you want to feel. I have searched myself and I know who I am. And I'm complete in this process now. So it's, I look forward to a time when we're not externalizing our shadow in this way and we're not having the instinct to try. To, it's like the logic of, I will feel safer if I can eliminate this person. I understand why we're in it, but to me, it doesn't feel like ultimate truth. And there's just, there's such a deep healing available to us in these moments. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't think that cancel culture will stay around for a long time. It's just becoming so stale and a lot of people, most people, I guess, who truly want to connect to truth than their experience are starting to see these big cultural world situations where a year ago you would have been canceled for saying something and being, you know, labeled a conspiracy theorist. And now there's actual documentation and facts coming out saying, oh, this actually happened. And so what are they going to do? Like unban people from social media? Are they going to like uncancel? Like uncancel should be a new button on our computers, human computers. <laughs> Completely. And it's like this reconciliation. I think for all of us, you know, we can search ourselves and say like, where did I cancel someone? Even just like within my consciousness, like where was I like F that person, I'm done with them or F that part of myself. Like I'm going to cut off this aspect of my expression in order to, to stay safe because I don't think it's worthy or it's appropriate anymore. Um, but then everything is ultimately, yeah, asking for that, that deeper reconciliation and integration. Right. And with that, one of the other things I saw in my journey is um, this invitation to like go knowing what's best for others. You know, I saw a particular person who was just embodying an energy that I still was holding in my own body. I saw that person judging me, trying to like fight and do something good because they thought they were doing the best thing available. And I am sitting here going, oh, I'm the sovereign being and I'm spiritual and I'm doing good things in the world. And I know what's best for you. One day you'll come around and we'll be friends and I'll hug you. 
you know, even that, you know, behind that in my own being, there was like best wishing, like truly, I wish you, you be able to see beyond the duality of the labels and just walk your path. And of course, you know, this was just a reflection of part of me that was still kind of looking out what are parts of me that are not fully integrated, parts of me that are doing things wrong. Um, and it was such a slap in my face, uh, you know, in my ego of girl, like we all do this and you don't know what's best for anyone. And everyone's awakening journey is unfolding exactly at the pace they're able to receive it. And it's completely different for everyone. Totally. Like, yeah, it could, it makes me laugh and cry at the same <laughs> time because it's just, I've had, I've had to have that realization again and again and again, and like noticing who's like showing up in my reality in that kind of prickly way where I feel where some part of me is like wanting them to show up differently or like thinking that they're going to see things in the way that I see things eventually. And that's been, I think, one of the most humbling parts of my journey is continuing to surrender what I don't know. And it does feel like a gift of time. I wrote this poem that I think I'm going to repost on Instagram um, at some point soon. I wrote it last year. It was like June, July of 2020, um, all about grace and about the grace of these moments where we think that we know best for other people. And, the, and we think that we're extending them grace where we're like, oh, right. one day you'll be here. Yes. Only to then realize that it's us who's being given the grace, you know, pardoned for the way that we are being presumptuous about other people's experience. And yeah, it's making me think about astrologically how we're in the last few months of the South Node of the Moon being in Sagittarius. It moved there in May of 2020. And the South Node is like the trash can of humanity. It's like what we're purging. It's like the garbage disposal. Um, before that, it was in Capricorn for 18 months. And so that's when we saw this like clearing of distorted energy around time and like structures and masculinity and the beginning of the demolition of these structures in our world. And, and the distorted energy of Sagittarius is singular ideology. It's like false guru, false teacher. I know what's best. I'm overlooking all the details to fit in this like one singular vision of how the world really works. Um, and just everything that can be wrong about how we know what we know and how we pass knowledge on and like how we structure hierarchies of knowledge. Um, so I, especially as a Sagittarius rising, I'm really looking forward to this transit being over, but I'm making the most of the last few months. It'll be done um, basically by the beginning of 2022 and everything that we're speaking about feels very connected to that. It's like mm -hmm. we're moving through this collective reworking of how we, what is our relationship to truth and mm -hmm. like power within truth as well. Mm -hmm. what do you tell people who might be yourself sometimes or friends or clients who understand all of these things but there's still this visceral fear of showing up and speaking their truth um, my perspective on this is that the more of us just show up and trust will be guided without knowing exactly how it's going to look like. It's going to light up more lights on the grid. And I'm curious to see how you see this and how you invite people into showing up when, even when it's unknown, even when it's scary. Mm. It's a big question. It's a question that I feel like I've been living for a long time and one version of the answer stays very consistent, but then in this specific temporal moment, I do want to acknowledge just how heightened the stakes feel for people. Oh, 
because we understand how significant it is what we're putting out in the world, right? We're being brought to this initiation of like, it isn't just an idle thing to say something. It has a ripple effect. Um, our words are very, very, very powerful. Um, and so there's this like maturation of understanding our impact more fully at the same time that the policing of other people's expression is, has just gotten so intense um, on so many different levels. And so, and, and it's interesting also astrologically where there's a transit happening right now that's exactly where we were in the buildup to World War II when there was obviously a huge amount of propaganda and censorship happening. Um, and also the late 1600s um, witch trials. And we're repeating a certain place um, in, in the Zodiac there in terms of where Neptune is placed and a few other things. And so I see us going through the purge of this programming really deeply, this like witch programming, this fear of, I will literally be exterminated if I share my truth. And that always feels important for me to say because it helps contextualize why it feels so intense beyond, you know, it's like, I think that one of the, we're, we're leaning into sovereignty in this way that's very important and also where I see us collapsing out this kind of artificial colonial cult of the individual in our society where everything's just a personal problem. And it's like your struggle with authenticity is not just you having your own stuff that you have to work through. It's like you're participating in a collective shift that goes way beyond you. Um, and so I find that that is very helpful. And then what I heard when you first asked the question was like, get into the body. It's like somatic trauma work. Like how do we regulate the nervous system and over time cultivate a feeling of safety and take ourselves out of this fight or flight? And ultimately for me, it starts with becoming your own safe space. Like if you are scared to say something online, but you won't even write it in your journal or put on a one person show in your living room about it or paint about it or sing about it or dance about it or feel about it in your own space, then, you know, it's again, you're like looking to the external world as evidence of what is safe rather than um, creating that safety within ourselves, because ultimately we're going to feel very, very unstable if there's a part of us subconsciously wondering if we're going to cancel ourselves, right? If we're going to repress these parts that are wanting to come forward. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a deep process. Is there anything specific that you feel like you're doing to support yourself in sharing authentically. I'm about to go get chiropractic adjustment, which is awesome. Cause I've been apparently um, I've been told by Michelle Sine, my mentor that we collect a lot of energy on the base of our head and our soles of our feet, our souls, soles of the feet. <laughs> um, and so I've been using salts to rub it in when I'm in the shower and just like cleanse and purify and also microdosing psilocybin mushrooms has been incredibly, incredibly powerful in moments of total forgetfulness and being like so frazzled. What am I doing when I go on my protocol and take my mushrooms? There's just such a background it's like a background music. It's like a background sense of, oh, I have these mycelial networks and I am part of nature and we're cool. You know, like no matter what happens right here, we're cool back there in the back seat. I just, yeah, I just saw like the, the mushrooms like crawling up into your nervous system. It's like when we connect in that way, it's, it is like plugging into the organic grid and like collapsing out that actual physical feeling of separation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also not giving a shit really, <laughs> you know, like if there's one big lesson that I took away from my experience, it's, it's that like there's so many 
so much of our life force energy goes towards checking all the boxes and pleasing. And as soon as we just step back, there's just all this energy that opens up that allows us to actually be present with what is and notice what we need, notice others and have fun in the human experience. And also Trader Joe's pumpkin tea. Just went to Trader Joe's for the first time in years. And we had such a blast. I love grocery shopping. You know, it's one of my favorite activities in the world. I just love picking up the little jars, looking what flavors are available, what are new product releases, talking to the associates. Oh, I'm going to try their celery juice. And they have this new almond almond butter banana smoothie. Um, I just love, you know, I'm in this stage. I don't know how long it'll last, but right now in this moment, I'm in a stage where I just have this desire to be fed. I want to be taken to restaurants. I want people to make me food, to bring me food. And even when I have all of the same ingredients in my fridge, um, I don't want to make it because my creative energy is going towards other things. And going to Trader Joe's and buying some of the things we can just, you know, make that are semi-made that are easy, just felt so nourishing. I feel like, whoa, I can actually put my energy where it's meant to go and cook another time when I'm inspired to. I love that. I also love grocery shopping, especially with someone else. Like when it's like a collaborative thing that feels like domestic in that way where you're like, okay, like we're, it's like a social experience that I think is also very ancient and like reminds us of what our ancestors, I think, did a lot more of, of like, you know, going to the marketplace and seeing what people had. And um, yeah, it's so, it is so satisfying. And when someone picks up a sweet potato and says, hey, I thought this looks like you, or (laughs) gets a bag of popcorn and says, hey, you know, this is, this has all these herbs that are your favorite herbs. Um, I got this for you. Even if I don't want it, just the act of someone thinking about me and a certain food reminding them of me just is so profoundly human and a moment worth living for. For sure. That is definitely like one of my love languages as well. Like when I'm with, and it's definitely part of my like coming down off the mountain of my my monk purification period is having those experiences of like people, like even when I came over to your house last winter, which is like so long ago now, it's kind of wild to think how much life has been lived this year. Um, But you made some just like incredible food and the experience, it's like, it's so much more than the nourishment of the food, like the experience of the love and the care and the ritual of it um, is incredibly, incredibly nourishing. And in return, you brought us a bar, two bars of Hue chocolate. And one of the things I miss around here, uh, sometimes you can find it. A lot of times you can't find it near where we live. And you brought it to us and you brought us the exact favorite flavors for each one of us. And I will never forget that. That was such a satisfying moment for me too, because I did it on such an intuitive whim. And I was just like, okay, I think I should bring this for them. And I had this story in my head. I was like, Ksenia is like so hooked up with all the good stuff. I'm sure she already has like a lifetime (laughs) supply of who, like whatever. And I surrendered it. And I felt into my gut of like, which are the two ones that I should bring them and yeah, it was like one of those beautiful, beautiful God moments. Um, and just to circle back to what you said about not giving a shit, I think that's also like huge medicine to live into because the fear is there no matter what. Like that's something that I feel like all major leaders that I look up to say, like Audrey Lord talked about how she was like, "It, you're going to be afraid no matter what. Like if you give into the fear and you're still silent, like you're going to die that way too. Like, and which way do you want to go? And would you rather face extermination or the fear of extermination blazing as your full self or still, still die, still decay, still, you know, be consumed by everything eventually, but having never actually let it rip. 
Yes. Yes. Did you say who kitchen or is that how you say it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think, think I might have said who. Is it Hugh? Who? I mean, I don't know. I'm someone who says cantaloupe and Eric won't stop correcting me. Apparently it's can <laughs> cantaloupe, cantaloupe, like can't elope, but I did elope kind of. And it's I never know. I never know how to say, you know, English is my second language and Eric. How would you say the chocolate? I, I've been saying hue chocolate, but I heard you say it otherwise. And I'm like, oh my gosh, these whole years I've been saying it wrong. I mean, I think we'll have to like look up the founders talking about it, but it feels like a, a fluid multidimensional opportunity for mm -hmm. multiple, multiple truths. I, I'm on board with that. Um, I would love to first of all make sure that you share whatever is coming through your channel and then hold on there's there's a specific question i want to ask but i feel like there's something i'm meant to hold space for you to share so let's just i'm going to breathe into that I feel very surrendered in this moment. Mm -hmm. So the piece I would love to play with is this idea of creating a body of work and it living online as your portfolio and then going through identity shifts and what is the most aligned thing to do with this body of work? You know, should you go and sell the business to someone or archive the content just in case one day it will become alive in your experience again? Um, those are some of the things I've been sitting with. And I know that, I mean, part of me is really pulled to pull an Aaron Rose with my Instagram feed on the current at home with Xenia account that I'm seeing if I can change to Xenia Brief to make my main Instagram home in one place, taking all the fragmented parts of myself and bring it in one place. And um, there's there was over 3,000 posts the other day. I've already archived and deleted half of them. And there's still a lot. And I'm going through some of them. And I'm reminded with such love to so many beautiful experiences I've been through, people that I love, some beautiful work that I've done that I totally forgot about. And yet there's this desire to just like wipe it clean and then shoot this amazing video of like, here's who I am now and here's what's alive and I'm here to vibrate at my truth. And I know you've done that. You've wiped everything that you've done online. And with that, you know, comes the risk of, well, if someone wants to book you as a public speaker, you don't have the post showing that you've done that. Someone wants to book you for brand partnerships. Well, that portfolio work is no longer there. And I feel like all of these fears of what's, what if someone can't find it are so 3D and so old and not even real. Um, and there's so much liberation and freedom and just letting go of all of it. Um, and also at the same time, there's the invitation of moment by moment, like post by post, what is meant to stay and what is meant to go instead of like blank statement. What is your experience? Because you feel so playful to me and alive with how you interact with your online work on social media. Thank you so much for that reflection. It means a lot to hear that because um, that's what I'm, I've definitely been living into my playfulness more and more. And it's like the more mature I get, the more, and like the more sort of experienced I get in certain ways, the more I feel like I just have to keep like poking at it all and just like being silly about it. And I definitely take, I would say that my like existential plan B on my life is to become a surrealist artist. Like I love Salvador Dali and Yoko Ono. And I think those, that kind of art will be expressed more and more in my work, but there is a part of me that is like, has that trickster energy and loves to find sincerity where I can and then kind of poke at the construct 
where I can't. Um, and it's interesting because it was really aligned for me at the time to archive my Instagram. Um, and now I'm living into, I feel like I'm about to step into a, a new season where I'm, even today I was thinking, oh, there's this post I think I might unarchive. And cause I didn't delete anything. I just archived it. Um, and I'm in a place where I'm really considering what it looks like to bring it all back together and like welcome all these different aspects of myself to the table again. And um, I know I'm definitely like going through an update on my website and my brand and, and just like my overall strategy and my sense of what it is that I'm bringing to the world. And I feel like by the spring, that'll be, I'm really, I've always loved the, to go with the cycles of nature and I can feel that I can feel that energy right now of tilling the soil and seeing what wants to stay and weeding some things, but then also reintegrating others. Um, and I think ultimately it's like, we have to just do what feels correct in the moment. And then we learn from it, right? If I had not, if I had been like, no, I need to honor all aspects of myself and keep my Instagram the exact way it was, that would have been its own box. But now, because I've had that experience, I can feel myself weaving in these past threads um, with new perspective. And the last thing I'll say there is that in human design, um, I'm a four, six type and anyone with a six or a three in their profile, basically, but especially a six, once you end your Saturn return and you turn 30, um, there's basically the first 30 years of your life or this highly experimental period where you're trying on all these different identities before you reach this new level of like mastery and kind of alchemy with everything that you've collected. And that threshold for me happened last winter. And so I feel like I'm in this very curious, attentive phase of seeing what I collected in the last 10 to 15 years and seeing how it wants to be remixed and shared now. So I'm definitely, Remix. and I'm resisting. <laughs> what? Remix. Remix. <laughs> Flip it and reverse it. Um, <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding the temptation to rush to an easy conclusion myself with what is, what's wanting to come through, because I also know that the medicine of the future of like the healing that we're doing is like, we can't rush to heaven, right? <laughs> we can't rush. Like if paradise isn't full of haste, then we can't necessarily hasten our way there and so I feel like I'm breathing more deeply into a more organic cultivation. Mm. One of those cultivations was your course God is my boss which I bought and I was just blown away the energy behind it the specific strategies you offer and just such purity of intention behind it was so felt and it felt like taking a lot of the different bits and pieces I've been learning on my own journey as an entrepreneur, as a human, as a mentor, as a guide, taking all of these pieces from all these different books from A Course in Miracles and Abraham Hicks, you know, all the different pieces that resonate with me taken into one place and expressed in a language that actually I understand that resonates and that is actionable. So thank you for your service, sir. Thank you for receiving it. Truly, I am so grateful to hear that that's been your experience. And in some ways, that's like the phase that I'm in right now is even so much of what I created, especially in the last year was like, so intensely channeled that I'm like waking up as a human being and being like, what even is this? Like, I know what it what it is. And I know how it felt when I created it. But how is it functioning in the world and what does it mean to be a steward of something that is serving people and to keep cultivating it um, in a long-term way? Mm. So what was your experience of 
creating the program, how, how is it still present in your experience, in your own experience, you know, working for God and, um, yeah, anything else that feels alive around it? Hmm. Yeah. God as my boss was the culmination of the realization that I had in 2020 about my relationship with God. I have a very deep devotional practice of prayer that I've had for many years and full surrender every day, my will to your will, um, lifestyle of, of devotion. But in 2020, it was like God took my hand and like showed me how I had been living over the last few years and was like, yes, you learned about metaphysics. Yes. You incorporated these, these techniques, you learned about shadow work, you have been healing in these different ways, but the thing that came first was your surrender to me. And I didn't have that positionality fully consciously correct in my mind until then. Um, I knew that I was living in that way, but I, I saw it on a way deeper level, this like foundational purity and protection that that level of surrender to God had created for me. Um, and it felt really, with everything that was flying around, especially in 2020, it felt like I was being called to offer something very simple and foundational that would support people like me who have these like wild brains and all these ideas and all these capabilities and all these like ways of serving and seeing, oh my God, here's a problem. Here's a solution. Here's another problem. Here's another solution. Like there's so many things that we can do. And I started to see the beauty of like truly living from that place of surrender where it's like, there's so much I could do. And there's all these ways I can mentally jerry rig my way to my idea of success but what would happen if I truly believed that I would be fully provided for? Mm -hmm. And I, like when I turn myself over to God, it's, it's like not this like death of self, it's this release of the matrix. It's this release of my, the consciousness structure that I'm in. It's like, I'm a little stream of water and then I'm going back into the full stream so that I can be, relieved of anything that's distorted and then guided to create and experience what's actually in my highest good. Um, and, and the creation of it was like a very doing nothing else for multiple days, just doing it, channeling it, sleeping, eating, doing drinking your and, celery juice, <laughs> drinking my celery juice. Exactly. Um, and yeah, it's been really, it's been beautiful to look back and to feel my willingness to allow it to come through because my human self and my human mind um, wouldn't have thought to create something like that. Mm, why not? Or there would have been, I think, more because obviously like my human self and my human mind like did create it, you know, like <laughs> God was not <laughs> in um, mighty networks or in, you know, on the internet, plugging <laughs> everything in and editing the meditations. Um, but it's the kind of thing I think I could have talked myself out of doing mm. based on fear or wondering if it was actually going to be of service, but there was just a sense of this is what I'm being called to do. Um, and a sense of like, I can't go to the next thing I'm supposed to do in my life until I make this. Mm. And that's all we can do. What am I being called to do right now in this moment? And I feel like when we don't say yes to this, because we're so busy doing everything else, we clog up our channel and that's where we get snowballed into who even am I? What am I doing? What's my worth? Show me, save me. <laughs> For sure. And it's like wild to see how we can end up in these situations where like all of a sudden we're like, oh, I haven't prayed or I haven't checked in in a few days or a few weeks. And like, I'm on a path that I haven't invited God 
into and I'm all of a sudden feeling the brittleness of my human ego's capacity to maintain the construct that I'm in um, and I, I, I the last thing I'll say about like why I created it is that I started to feel like I couldn't work with anybody until they had leaned into their devotional practice of what they were actually devoted to I started to feel like any of the other techniques that I could offer anybody who wanted to work with me on their mission and their calling, um, it had, it was optional before, but in terms of what I knew would actually work or support people based on my experience, um, I felt this really deep call to give people the tools to create that foundation. And I've had so many insights in those meditations that are included in the course. I can't remember in the moment. I'm sure there's somewhere in my millions of journals. I have different journal for each mood. And I remember sending you a voice note and being like, Aaron, oh my goodness. Oh, I remember what it was. Oh my gosh. It was acknowledging the aspect of myself that had this deep desire to be invited to Richard Branson's Necker Island. And, you know, I've been making myself wrong and feeling embarrassed and shame for being called for this experience for a long time. And then what I saw is that perhaps there's this deep desire to end up there because there's some connection or healing or metamorphosis that is meant to occur. Only my human body's place there and my egoic desire to be chosen and seen and invited is just a stepping stone for what's meant to happen. And as soon as I was able to see it from this other perspective and stop making myself wrong, it just completely shifted and lost its weight. I love that. I remember getting that note and it just felt like such a gift to hear that about your process. And that is part of the medicine that I found woven into that course. There's a meditation in there um, that I call God's blank check. That's about like, if you actually believe that you would be provided for fully, what would you actually be dreaming about? Like, would you, instead of thinking that you want to make $5,000 a month in your online business, would you actually be realizing that you have the tools and the calling to completely redo the food system or completely reinvent what education looks like, or, um, you know, to build something much more substantive. And I think that's a paradox that Marianne Williamson talks about it in A Return to Love, where we think that humility is going to make us smaller. And it does make a part of us smaller. Or it clears away a certain false grandiosity. But often when we surrender is when we're, we're called to even more magnificent experiences. And that's definitely been my experience too, where I, there are things that I've lived through and people that I've served and, and, and experiences that I've had that um, my human ego and mind is still like, wait, God wanted that for me. Like, it's okay to have that. <laughs> it's okay for something that amazing to happen. And um, because and I think that is where the religious programming comes into where we've been taught that like desire is bad and that we don't deserve mm -hmm. satisfaction or like, you know, for you to have this experience of being invited to the island, like that will be mm -hmm. nourishing for you. And that mm -hmm. matters. That's how swimming in Barton Springs with you and that whole morning fell when we visited Austin a little while ago. It was, it was actually this voice in my head is like, is this real life? Are we, is Aaron an angel? What is going on? How do we get connected? Thank you, God. <laughs> That's how I was feeling about you. Like, and even just like your other friends that were there and you know how much I love Eric and appreciate him so much. And it, when I think about that day, it all feels so crystalline, you know, it feels so like organic and pure and human and beautiful and just like such a gift. Mm. My final question to you, even though I could go on for forever, um, it has to do with surrender and God. I would love to, well, I'm called to share a glimpse into the experience that I had with it. 
and hear what your experience with it has been. In my journey a week ago, I didn't really feel a presence of God, like uh, a being or a force that's loving me and guiding me. I just felt presence of a force. And what I was shown is that we as humans get to direct it. You know, we choose to direct it and channel it towards destruction or love in each moment. And that's why simplest practices, devotional practices, however they look like for each one of us, for me, Abraham Hicks has been really, really, really doing it, um, are vital because every moment is that choice of what are we going to, what frequency are we going to plug into? And then there was a moment where I was just so deep. I felt like I'm being just punched left and right from one wall to the other wall. I'm like, how do I even process this? Wait, but let me write it down. And then I see this human hand writing it down for me. And then there was this moment, I guess that's the moment of surrender where there was a voice that said, hold on, we need some water, just get some water. And I saw that for myself. And I also saw that for the plant in the corner of the room. And in that moment, I'm starting to think, how am I, how in the world am I going to get water? Because I'm in this like, you know, field of nothingness. I see everything, but this human realm wasn't really accessible. And I was just, you know, in Russia, I would say breaking my head, thinking about how am I going to get that water? And in that very moment, Eric walks in and brings me a glass of water. And I hadn't seen him for hours since I went into the journey. And so to me, it's, the way that I interpret it in this moment is God and the loving force that guides us, that helps us hear whispers is that voice that sometimes is so little that says, hold on, just take it easy, drink some water, we'll figure it out one step at a time. And it's not necessarily something's like, all right, wake up today, go there. You're going to meet this person. You're going to find this amount of money in your bank. If you do, like, it's not really like that it's a lot more gentle and we actually have to get very quiet to feel and hear that love and that whisper yeah i would love to i would love to hear anything you can reflect on that or share about your experience for sure i love that story i love eric as the the guardian angel that he is hearing the call and bringing the water um yeah, for me, it's similar. Like, it's interesting, even like hearing you talk about that, it made me think about how when people hear me talk about God, they might assume that I'm having some like Moses on the mountaintop yes. experience all the time. Yes. Um, and it's interesting, actually, because my name is Aaron and Aaron means mountain and Aaron in the Bible was the go between because Moses was like, in my colloquial phrasing, he was like, tripping the F out. And just like fully in the field with God on top of the mountain. And they talk about how like his face was too bright for people to look at him. And he had a speech impediment. Basically it's like people couldn't vibe at the level that he was at. And Aaron is his brother was the one who translated the messages to the people. Um, so for whatever reason that wanted to come through, but my experience is it's very human. It's very quotidian, which means daily. It's very like mundane in a certain way. It feels, it feels very human. It feels like I learn about my human nature. Like I, every once in a while, I have like a big God moment where it's like, whoa, this is really hitting me. Um, but most of the time, it's like a quiet, devotional relationship with reality and where I feel it somatically in my body in terms of surrender is there's the sovereignty piece where I have to get clear on what I'm experiencing and I have to get clear on what I'm desiring and what I want to create and like I have free will you know and that's something that I have to be anchored in and, and noticing where I'm ignoring desires or needs or instincts and claiming those um, and then the surrender piece feels like the best way I can describe it. Let me know if this makes sense is it's like, if you ever have something that feels like a problem and you feel like you can't like move on until you solve the problem, but you kind of feel like you're waiting for more information. And when you're holding the problem, you feel kind of cut off from everybody else. You're like, nobody at this fun friends hangout knows that like 
there's a leak in my kitchen and like I have to fix it or you know there's something weird happening in my business that I have to work out does that like totally make sense that example I was having a conversation about it this morning of you know I'm not able to create my new offering until I fix this course and make it this way is one expression of that Okay, cool. Yeah. So that feeling of like, to me, it feels like I'm like holding something completely in my body and it starts to feel very like suffocating. And I know that if I'm having that feeling that it's really time to surrender because I am acting like it's a hundred percent my responsibility to solve what's happening with the information and the capacity that I currently have rather than, I don't know, it's like, it's almost like the energy of someone who's like, I, I'm going to keep searching my own mind for how to get us not lost while I'm driving <laughs> rather than stopping and like allowing something new in, which might be a map or a GPS reset. And so I very somatically feel and pick up the things that are inside of me. Sometimes it's like scooping out a cantaloupe. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it feels like I'm like scooping out the bowels of, of, of a gourd. Um, and sometimes it feels like I'm picking up rocks that are in like a body of water and I pick it up and then I, I physically feel myself turn it over. And I say, like, I, compl- I turn over all of my ideas about this situation, about what I'm meant to be doing, about um, what the correct course of action is. Um, I surrender even my ideas of like, you know, what success in this situation looks like. Like I give, I give, I give over even my self-concept of like what kind of person I am and how I'm supposed to handle this. Please show me the way, like make this situation right, restore to love. Um, and that is generally when sometimes immediately, but often, you know, in the next few days, it's like a a wave of fresh air comes in and there's a whole new perspective where the problem changes into something completely different. And it's not what I thought it was. Um, And that for me is the practice of surrender. It's like when I feel like I'm holding something separate from the field of infinite potential and turning it over to the higher sight that can actually guide me. The last example I'll give is like, sometimes I do see it like as if I was dumping all of my receipts from the year on my like tax accountant's desk where I'm like, here's all the information. I don't know what to do with it. Like, please organize this for me and then give me, tell me what I'm meant to do next based on this. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's if you didn't cut the cantaloupe open, you wouldn't see the seed sprout. Yeah. It's yeah, for sure. It's like that or, or it's like, if you don't clean out your fridge, all the stuff in it is going to rot instead of like becoming compost and making space for other things too. Yes. I did that yesterday and it's phenomenal. The things you find in the back of your fridge, highly recommended. And I've been doing that too for Mercury (laughs) retrograde, just like cleaning everything. And you know, you mentioned the shift in perspective. A Course in Miracles reminds us that a miracle is simply a shift in perspective. And, and it is. And thank you so much for sharing all of these beautiful, beautiful examples. And I totally feel everything you're saying so deeply. And there's so many synchronicities of the things you've brought up that you might not have known why, but that have been in my field very profoundly. And I trust that it's the same for everyone who is called to listen and be with us and share this space because the age of the lone wolf is over and we're truly rising together and body chills hearing that i'm so grateful that we're doing it together Mm -hmm. and that we're walking together is there anything else that you want to be witnessed in sharing Mm. um I don't think so. I actually filmed a YouTube vlog. I would be honored if you check that out once that's out where I share 
boom, 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 boom. I, I just shared all of the notes of the main messages that came through in my journey, um, which I'll also probably be posting as an audio on the podcast that kind of goes a little deeper into some of the places we've touched, but yeah, I feel complete and I'm ready to be Cairo cracked. And, uh, actually we do have some huge chocolates in our pantry, which I'm thinking about now. Um, and as I always text you, I'm just, it makes me feel so happy and grounded knowing that you are alive at the same time. It's just really, you are such a light beam that always reminds me who I am. So thank you for shining so brightly. Thank you. Thank you for that witnessing. And obviously like I received that and also anything that you see in me is in you. And I frequently have the same feeling of just feeling so grateful for the just totally unique being that you are. And I'm genuinely so grateful to be on earth at the same time as you. And I'm so excited to see what is going to be birthed and experienced, not just like created, but like humanly felt and lived in mm. this next chapter that you're, you're choosing. Here we go. Calabunga, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Off we go. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much. Um, thank we're you. Give Eric a hug for you and have a blessed Please rest do. of your day. You too. So much love. Bye.